hi everyone. Well, for today's talk, we're having Dr. Amy Kusayeski. So I'm going to introduce her briefly. Dr. Amy Kusayeski is currently a professor of mathematics and neuroscience in the radiology department at Well Cornell Medicine and Computational Biology Department at Cornell University. She obtained her PhD in Applied Mathematics from Case Western Reserve University in 2009, after which she went to Well Cornell Medicine and never left for over a decade. Amy has been interested in understanding how the human brain works in order to better diagnose, prognose, and treat neuro neurological diseases and injuries. Quantitative approaches, including machine learning apply applied to data from rapidly evolving neuroimaging techniques, have the potential to enable groundbreaking discoveries about how the brain works. Amy has a particular interest in non-invasive brain stimulation and pharmacological interventions like psychedelics that may be used for modulate to modulate brain activity to promote better recovery or from disease or injury. So after that small thing, it's like I'll just leave her to it and hope you enjoy this. Stuff. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to join you all today and tell you about some of the work that's going on in my lab. I will say I did visit McGill a long time ago. Alan Evans invited me, and I think it was probably like 2011 or 12, so it's been a while. But the campus is beautiful, and I, and I love visiting. So I'm glad to sort of be adjacent to that again. Anyway, so, okay, so I think the, the intro was great. It tells you a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about today because my, my PhD is in applied math and, and my title there is Professor of Mathematics and Radiology. So a lot of what I do is, is using computational approaches like mathematical modeling to sort of understand and study the brain's anatomy and physiology and the relationships between the two of those. And particular interests are in, you know, trying to figure out how brains recover from injuries so that we can devise strategies to sort of support those mechanisms. So today I'm going to be telling you about sort of our work in network control theory. And so network control theory is, is an engineering sort of concept in engineering where you have some kind of interconnected network. It could be, let's say, a highway system or a computer circuit that has some kind of connections between nodes or, or regions in, in, in the network. And using network control theory in engineering, it comes from the idea that a dynamical system can be controlled. And so you might be able to, let's say, inject some kind of activation or substrate into one of these nodes and be able to push the trajectory of the system over time into a, a state that you want it to be in. And so we know that neural systems also change their dynamics to meet task, task demands. And so this, this fact allows us to perform our daily life activities, including responding appropriately to our environmental cues and having continuous thought processes. And more and more research is allowing us uh, a window into seeing the neuroimaging substrates of this mechanism, which we call cognitive control. And so it, it's actually, the brain is a, an inter interesting example of a complex system with a defined pattern of interconnectedness. So this can be represented as a network with nodes and gray, ma or gray matter regions and edges between them or the white matter connections. So the network that I talk about on which we're going to model is the structural connectome or the white matter connectivity network that you devise by basically chunking the brain up into parts and then assessing with diffusion MRI how much wiring or structural connections there are between pairs of regions. And so that consists, that, that makes up the structural connectivity network. So the dynamical system is based around the idea that the, this, this is the, the network we're going to model. And then activity or the activation of different brain regions and the sort of firing of neuron, neurons in, in regions um, is going to be the sort of activation dynamics that we track that's, that's based around this structural connectome. So if anybody has any questions, I guess they just will. I'm not sure if I can hear you in there, but yeah. Please ask away if you have anything, questions. All right, so a lot of what we work in my lab is using fMRI. So this is a blood oxygenation level dependent signal based MRI modality that measures the oxygenation of the blood, which is tightly coupled to neuronal activity. And so the, this is like a time series that we measure at a voxel level, and then we can extract from that sort of region level activities over time. And then I talked a little bit about this. This is the brain structural connectivity that we're going to base our network control theory around. 
and uh, I think people may know this already, so I'm not going to go into too detail, but basically diffusion MRI allows you to delineate the diffusion of water molecules in the brain. And this diffusion happens along white matter tracks more than it will happen when you have like a mixed voxel or, or across them. And so you, from the shape of the diffusion uh, of the water molecules, you can get an idea of the, the fiber orientation and directions. And from that, you can do tractography, which is kind of what this video is, is showing on the, on the right is pairs of regions in uh, green and red with their white matter connections between them in blue. And so then in the end, what it is reduced down to is this bottom left-hand corner here, this structural connectivity matrix. And that's what we're going to be using um, in our model of brain dynamics. So there's so many publicly available data sets that have sort of structural and or functional connectivity in different contexts. So of course, a lot of you may know about the Human Connectome Project, which is this massive database. Now it's got all the way from five-year-olds to 100-year-olds and across the lifespan of looking at the functional and structural connections in the, in the brains of people who don't have any specific diagnoses and, and or injuries. And then there's, of course, things like the Enigma Consortium, where people are kind of pooling data together from certain neuroimaging modalities things like addiction or neuroendocrinology or traumatic brain injury. And so, yeah, there's a lot of work in sort of combining and bootstrapping data together, which is, is a really great part of this movement. So there's lots of ways. I talked about what the functional and structural brain networks are, and there's lots of different ways that you can model this relationship. And this includes things like using systems of neural mass models, which are differential equations that you know, sort of model the trajectory of the activation over time based on the, and around the structural connectome is, is kind of incorporated into those um, models as well. And then there's things like graph theoretical models, looking at the structure, the topology of the networks and, and sort of relating the function to structure in that way. There's also statistical models where we kind of even just do straight regression of some sort of extracted metrics of structural connectivity to predict functional connectivity. And then in that same realm, there's there's a lot of work now in machine learning and using the structural connectivity matrix to predict functional connectivity. So, so there's a lot of effort in mapping between structural and functional connectivities and functional dynamics. And the thing that I'll be talking about today is this network control theory. So I'll just go ahead and get into it. So the first sort of concept to understand is the, the quantification of brain states. And so here, what we have is a, is a visualization of how we define the brain states. So let's say we have a bunch of subjects data and a bunch of perhaps multiple sessions uh, of fMRI from those subjects. This is all based on resting state data. And so what we have essentially is it, for each subject in each MRI, we have a time by number of regions matrix. Okay, so this is how what, what the activity looks like across the entire brain for all of these regions over time. And we can apply k-means clustering to this, to this pooled data to identify these commonly recurring patterns of brain activity. Okay, so here's just an example, in, and it's projected into this three-dimensional space, but of course, it's the number of dimensions of the number of regions in the parcellation we're using. So, you know, something like a 86-region atlas or a 400-region atlas. And so that's the dimension, but it's here, it's sort of being visualized in three dimensions, and you have this sort of separation of the different states. And they all have sort of their canonical patterns of brain activity that are represented with the with the brain uh, sort of maps there. So then once you have these brain states defined, that now what we have for each person and each scan is instead of a time by regions vector, we have a time by one vector. And that one vector tells us the state that we're in at that point in time. So now we have just a, a list of states and their orders uh, of the states for every subject for every session. So this is a way that we define the brain states. And now when we have those brain states, we can actually look at quantifying brain state dynamics. So let's say the most sort of straightforward measure of brain state sort of metrics is, is fractional occupancy or how much of my scan is spent in any given state. And so here it's just represented by showing you that list of, of states over time for a specific person. And here highlighted in blue is the same state. And so what that translates to is 25% fractional occupancy or 0.25 fractional occupancy for that particular state for that particular person. And then you can analyze, start to analyze the length of time or the amount of time spent in each of these states and, and see how they're different across different individuals or, or disease states or what have you. Another metric you could look at is dwell time, which is how long I spend when I come to a state, how long I spend in that state. And then another is appearance rate. So how often per minute, let's say, do I transition into a given state? 
And, and further on, uh, more, we can look at state sort of transition probabilities. So once we have this like list of time series states, we can see how likely it is that I transition from one state to another or that I stay in that same state when I'm in that state. So given any state, how likely am I to go to a different state or stay in that same state? So these are transition probability matrices for these different states. Okay, so in network control theory, the brain is considered this linear system where the activity of the brain, so the brain activity that's measured in our case, again, by fMRI, fMRI data, um, it's, it's, so it's a system where the activity at time t flows both passively through the network via diffusion process on the structural connectome, which is here given by A, and actively through the effect of external inputs that are, that are represented here in the equation by U. So this U can vary over time or it can be steady, but it's some kind of external input that is being influenced, that has influence in the system to control where the brain is going to go. So here is just a, a representation of using, you know, tractography to extract the structural brain networks. And we have these different states, let's say. And so one question in network control theory is how do I go from one state to another? And what does my external input need to be to go from, let's say, this state to this state? And that is how we sort of define transition energy. So transit network control theory-based transition energy is essentially quantifying the amount of energy that I need to inject into the system to complete a state transition from one state to another. And those states being the ones that we had defined previously with using our resting state fMRI data. So here's just a visualization of it. So here is our X0 is our initial state and XF is our final state where we wanna to get to. And this sort of mesh is showing you the dynamic landscape. And our uncontrolled trajectory or just the diffusion on the structural connectome is, is what we call the uncontrolled trajectory. And that might not actually take us to our final state. So what we then need to do is identify our control inputs, our external influence that we need to devise or strategize or create to get us to that final state that we desire. And, and so we can also incorporate into this control strategy a, a weight matrix B, which tells, tells us how much influence each region has on the control dynamics. So if I, let's say, have if I know one region has more control over the system and another doesn't, then I might be able to incorporate that information into this matrix B that allows that region to have a little bit more control in the system. I'm not sure I need to go into this detail, but essentially this, these are the equations. This is the controllability ground. I mean, these are all things that are derived based on network control theory principles from engineering. So it's nothing that's new in neuroscience or neuroimaging, but essentially it's a way of us identifying the amount of energy that we need to inject into the system to complete a state transition. And so we go ahead and apply these in, in different states. And I'm going to talk a little bit about healthy control populations. So looking at this landscape or this dynamic landscape and trajectories in healthy control populations and how that relates to cognitive outcomes or age or hormones. And then we're also going to look at neurological disease and recovery, including MS and traumatic brain injury. And we're also going to look at the, the role of dopamine and how dopamine systems might control the system in an optimal way. And then finally, I'll talk about our work in psychedelics and, and looking at how network control theory can capture the changes in the dynamics of the brain when it's under the influence of psychedelics. So one of the first papers to come out, this is from Danny Bassett's lab at UPenn, and this was one of the first sort of applications of network control sure. theory. This first paper was from Danny Bassett's lab looking at the sort of controllability of different regions of the brain. And so they divide, they they used this metric called the nodal controllability or average controllability to look at how much influence each region has over the system in this network control theory modeling approach. And they found that regions that were more structurally, unsurprisingly, that were more structurally connected to the rest of the brain also had more control over the system's dynamics, which isn't too surprising. But they also found that regions in the default mode network and somatosensory networks had a larger portion of the available control in the system. So this is kind of just the first baby steps in, in understanding the brain as a, and modeling as a, using network control. Then there was this other paper, this was in 2020, this is kind of the first one to look at network control theory energetics and, and how they relate to cognitive tasks and cognitive performance. And so here, this is using the Human Connectome Project rest and task fMRI data. They found these five sort of states that they used uh, k-means to identify. 
and they have it, the bottom row here is just a, a cosine similarity between the brain state and each of these canonical brain states like somatomotor visual, de default mode network, uh, frontal parietal limbic, ventral attention, and dorsal attention. So you can see the, the black or the high amplitude brain activity and the red or the low. So this kind of just gives you an idea of what the, the brain states look like. They did a spatial correlation. They show that the, you know, there's these, they're not very similar to each other, which is expected using k-means. And they also looked at the transition probability matrix in the bottom right-hand corner. So this is how likely you are to transition to the column listed state from the row listed state. So this is, for example, how likely you are to transition from default mode positive to default mode negative. And they showed that the highest probabilities are from vis to default mode network states, so from lower to higher order, and lower probabilities overall for transitions from higher to lower order states. So it seems like the, the brain as a network control system might be favoring the, the flow of information from bottom up, if you will. They also looked at sort of, this is a fractional occupancy, that metric I discussed before for their five states. And you can see that at rest, the fractional occupancy of the DMN, unsurprisingly, is, is much higher than it is for these that might be more task uh, related. But then as you go to the NBAC task, um, you can see the default mode network activation or, or fractional occupancy goes down and the brain states uh, seem to be more frequently visiting this, this viz um, state. And it seems to be modulated by task demand. So here, this is fractional occupancy by the difficulty of the task. So on the left is rest and on the right is two back. Um, and you can see the default mode network uh, fractional occupancy kind of has a linear trend downward um, as, the, as the task gets a little bit more difficult and the, and the viz has a linear trend upward for um, as, your, as your task becomes more difficult. They also sort of looked at correlations between transition probabilities in particular individuals and working memory performance, and they actually found that transition higher transition probabilities from viz minus to default mode network positive were related to worse performance, whereas higher transition probabilities from viz minus to FPN was related to better performance. So I guess it could be argued that if you're you're going to a higher cognitively sort of in the hierarchy state that you might be performing better in your working memory task. And they also correlated these transition energies. So they calculated the transition energies between pairs of states, and they showed that these transition energies from any state to default mode positive decreased with increasing age. So it seems like as people get older, they have less transition energy demand to transition into this default mode network positive state. This is another really cool, very recent work from Lyndon Parks, a colleague of mine at Rutgers, who was looking at the PNC cohorts. This is the Philadelphia Neurodevelopment Cohorts, which is about 800 people who are aged 8 to 22 years. And he organized sort of the, the regions in the brain by sensory fugal axis that was kind of reflecting the cytoarchitectonic similarity to create this, what he called the SF hierarchy. And he calculated the energy that was required to transition from top down to bottom up states to quantify sort of the asymmetry in the transition energies across development. And his main findings were that transition energy is greater for transitions going from top down compared to bottom up. And relatedly, in sort of uncontrolled dynamics simulations, there was a preferential flow of, of information up the cortical gradient or, or activation up the cortical gradient of cytoarchitecture. So if you start at all of these points, you can see many more of them are moving upward in the hierarchy that are moving downward. So it's really just pointing to the fact that bottom-up information flow is a bit easier in the brain than top-down. Interestingly enough, he also showed that age-related decreases in this energy were more pronounced for top-down, which may indicate a reduction in the bottom-up versus top-down asymmetry across development, wherein that ratio between top-down and bottom-up energy is, is lessening as, as the subject ages. We also have done our, our own um, sort of analysis. So the previous analysis I showed you is based only on the structural connectivity, but you can also then use the, the states from fMRI and calculate based on a person's individual fMRI states, their global transition energies. And we did that with uh, all three of the HCP data sets. And we found an interesting pattern, which was that in development, it appears that males start out uh, sort of lower than females in their transit in their global transition energies, and they have larger increases over time in development. And females have more more of a flatter uh, sort of upward trend in development. So it seems that this this there might be sex differences in the global transition energies between males and females. And we also see in the young adult and aging that there's a decrease in transition energy as as person ages, which is kind of reflective of what Danny Bessette's lab had found in that first paper. So let me get into some of the results we have from the ABCD data set. So this is children age nine through ten, I think, at the first the first release that we looked at. 
And this was applying network control theory to this population to see if there's sort of any differences in transition energy when you're looking at family history of substance use disorder. So we had this hypothesis that perhaps changes in dopamine or in genetic, either genetically or environmentally influenced might cause shifts in the dynamics, brain dynamic landscape of individuals with the family history of substance use disorder. And we did see that there, there was a difference in age. There was an age effect, and this is an ANCOVA, of the global transition energy. So we see there's a very big difference between males and females. And then also, there isn't really a, an effective substance use disorder at a, at a global level. But when you look at it divided by sex, there is an effect of substance use disorder. And so when you plot them separately, you can see that in females, the individuals who have a family history of substance use disorder actually have higher transition energies than the subjects who don't when they're a female, and it's the opposite effect in males. So this seems to be a trend that we're finding when we're analyzing family history of substance use, that males and females tend to have the opposing effect across the groups when you compare them. We also looked at network level transition energies and how they relate to sex and psychological traits in this data. So we did a, a PC, PCA of the, a bunch of different behavioral metrics in the adolescent behavioral, the ABCD data. And we found these sort of three principal components, possibly showing overall severity of ADHD symptomology. PC2 is more externalizing behaviors and PC3 was internalizing behaviors. And we looked at how the sort of network level transition energies were related to these behavioral maps. And we see that the default mode network transition energy was related to the internalizing symptomology that was captured in PC3. And so there might be some relationship there between the amount of energy needed to transition into default mode network and the internalizing behavioral scores that you see in these subjects. So this is uh, from a student of mine, Emily, a former student. I'm very sad about it. Former student of mine, Emily Olson. Well, that's actually a McGill alumni. And she was working on this project with 23 individuals who had first-time Pontine stroke and 22 age match non-stroke controls. And they had fMRI and MRIs, anatomical MRIs at 7, 14, 30, 90, and 180 days post-stroke. And so here you can see these are the Fugelmeyer scores over the five sessions. And, and yellow is better, green is worse across all of the subjects that we had uh, for this uh, for this data. The brain states analysis was applied. We found that stroke subjects uh, spent significantly less time in a state that was dominated by FPN, frontal parietal activity, compared to controls at all time points after stroke. So that's what this is showing. So it's a, it's a pretty robust difference. And we also found that stroke subjects with, were less likely to stay in this FPN state, of course, and less likely to transition to the state from a motor dominant state, which, which makes sense because they're spending less time in it overall. So of course, the probability of transitioning there will be lower. We also found that the fractional occupancy and dwell time of this FPN state was associated with better outcomes, but only in individuals with dominant CST damage. We found a strong correlation between the amount of dominant CST overlap with the lesion that, that was related to the change in dwell time from this FPN state. So the more there was an overlap with the, with the S CST, the bigger the increases in frontal parietal, parietal dwell time at six months compared to one week. And so we thought that perhaps this tendency for larger motor, the tendency for the brain to have larger motor representation in the FPM, FPN on the dominant hemisphere was enabling better motor recovery for those with dominant CST damage. And, and these results have possibly implications for personalization in the design of therapeutic strategies, particularly non-invasive brain stimulation and promoting recovery from stroke. And that was a lot of information, but I will go slow in case people have questions. All right, so then this next study was in multiple sclerosis and looking at brain dynamics there. For my, my former postdoc, Jaren Tozlu, is now early faculty at, at Cornell. And we analyzed the brain activity landscape, including brain activity entropy, and the relationships to disability and lesion uh, burden in 100 people with multiple sclerosis and 19 age, matched, age and sex match controls. So here we have six states that were optimal, and we did a classification based on the transition energy matrices. And these are the coefficients in the model. So this is representing, this is showing you what kind of information was being used to classify between, for example, healthy control and MS subjects without disability, healthy control and MS uh, subjects with disability, and MS with and without disability. And looking at these feature importance coefficients, we observed that people with MS without disability tended to have lower transition energy compared to controls, and people with MS with disability tended to have increased transition energy compared to controls. 
So we thought that this could perhaps be some sort of compensation mechanism that initially keeps disability at bay in those subjects without disability, but then is exhausted over time, resulting in the development of disability. And this is reflecting a lot of work in, in functional connectivity as well, looking at sort of compensation mechanisms and increased functional connections in the people with MS early on in the disease. We also found that regional entropy was largely not significant between the three groups, but there was a global trend for decreased entropy in MS compared to controls and increased entropy in people with MS without disability versus those with disability. And across the populations of, of individuals with MS, we found there was a significant correlation that showed decreased entropy was related to both increased energy and increased lesion volume. And so these results sort of shed light on a possible mechanism of how MS-related damage to the brain's structural backbone could possibly impact the activity dynamics in the brain. So this is, we looked at global transition energy in young adults across their age and, and with alcohol use patterns. And here, what we did was we analyzed the HCP data, uh, young adult data, which has a lot of information on alcohol use. And we split people into those with um, sort of binge drinking or a diagnosis of alcohol use disorder um, and those that had minimal use of alcohol. And so we found actually that there was a, a decrease of um, entropy in the subjects with uh, heavy alcohol use and an increase in um, global transition energy, uh, global transition energies with alcohol use. And we also uh, looked at sort of the transition energies across pairs of, of states. And we saw that there was this increase in transition energy in many different states in people with alcohol use disorder. And we hypothesized <coughs> that potentially, excuse me, potentially this increase in transition energy was related to changes in dopamine that occur that are known to either pre-exist alcoholism or that it could be a consequence of. So we wanted to look at the, the sort of asymmetry in the top-down versus bottom-up transitions. And we, found, we analyzed the transition energy between a subcortical sort of state and a frontal parietal state, which was representing the higher order, and the subcortical state was just low order. And we found that there was a difference that was significant in the transition energy of the transition from going from subcortical to frontal parietal. So there was increased transition energy in people with heavy alcohol use to go from subcortical to frontal parietal states. And we also simulated dopamine dysfunction in our network control theory framework, where we took the high dopamine regions with a high level of dopamine receptor concentration and sort of rearranged them to have a lower amount of dopamine concentration. So it was sort of simulating some sort of dopamine dysfunction in the brain. And as we deplete more and more of this dopamine, we see increased transition energy. So our hypothesis was from the data itself and from the simulation that it could be potentially a mechanism for this increased transition energy is some sort of dopamine dysfunction in subjects with heavy alcohol use. So I'm going to wrap up with our, our psychedelic work. I think I have. So, so the sort of there's a bunch of different theories about the mechanism of action of of psychedelics, and one of them is from a collaborator of ours, Robin Carhart Harris, who collaborated with Carl Friston to come up with this relaxed belief under psychedelics or the Rebus hypothesis, it, and it views the brain as a prediction engine whereby perception and belief are shaped by both prior knowledge and incoming information. So there's this prior belief you have, and then there's the incoming information that combine to create your your perception of the world. So within Rebus, the psychedelics are postulated to translate to a decreased uh, precision weighting on prior beliefs. So really your prior beliefs are, have less weight, which then has an enabling effect on bottom-up information flow. So it's theorized that this observed increase in entropy of brain activity under psychedelics, which has been replicated across many, many, many studies, is reflective of reduced energetic demands for the brain to navigate its dynamic landscape. So that was our hypothesis, that this increased entropy that is observed during psychedelics is would be re also related to this decrease of transition energy in the dynamic landscape. And so I just want to point out that high levels of caffeine also have a influence on entropy in the same way as psychedelics. So I thought that was kind of an interesting study. This was done with some really high level of caffeine and it was shown showing this plot is just showing increased entropy of brain activity under caffeine. Anyway, okay. So you you've seen the, these figures from now for now for a couple times, but essentially the hypothesis was that this this is the usual landscape of the brain and then after psychedelics the brain's landscape sort of flattens a bit and it, it enables more activity to be to increase your activity to increase in entropy due to this like lowering of transition energy and barriers between states. So this was data that was collected by our sorry 
by our uh, collaborator, Robin Card Harris, and it was 20 healthy volunteers who went underwent two MRI scanning sessions that were 14 days apart. And one day they were given intravenous placebo, and on the other day they received LSD that was infused over two minutes, and it was 115 minutes before our resting state scanning. After the infusion, subjects went in for a brief accumulation acclimation period in a mock, mock MRI scanner, and there were sort of three se about seven minute long resting state scans acquired. The first and third had no stimulation and the second scan involved listening to music. So we didn't analyze that. We just yeah, were remaining with, with about 14 minutes of resting state scans. One subject was excluded for anxiety and four for excessive motion. So there were 15 subjects in total that we analyzed. And there was a second data set which with totally different people. And this was in nine volunteers over two days. They either got placebo or IV psilocybin and they were immediately scanned after the administration of both substances with five minutes of fMRI data. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to show was the the sort of the metrics of the dynamics, and you can see in orange is the LSD and blue is or teal is the placebo, and you can see during the LSD scan there is definitely more fractional occupancy of sort of bottom states, so the somatomotor states, and less occupancy in this frontal parietal state in the LSD uh, scans. We also showed that, analyzed the data, calculated the transition energies between pairs of states, and we found that all transition energies were lowered in, in LSD and psilocybin. So it does seem that our hypothesis about this lower transition energy bore out. And here's a, a really striking figure of the, the data where you have the placebo infusion. So this was the continuous scanning that was done in the infusion here for the placebo. And you can see that the sort of transition energies across subjects is, is pretty similar. And then here you can see the psilocybin infusion and quite a, quite a decrease in the global transition energy after the injection. We also showed that across subjects, people who had larger reductions in their transition energies also had larger increases in appearance rate and larger increases and in, decreases in dwell time. And so the reduction of energy by LSD was correlated with this, yeah, these changes in this dwell times as well as appearance rate. We also calculated a measure of complexity called the Lempel-Ziv complexity, which is now being called metastate complexity by the, by the field. And it's basically using these, these time series of states and to calculate a, a measure of complexity of the signal. And we showed that across subjects, the, the larger you had, the Larger increases there were in the levels of complexity, the larger decreases there were in this global transition energy. This was replicated by another collaborator. We didn't collaborate with them, but we gave them our data and they analyzed our codes to extract levels of complexity. And they saw the same effect with, I think this is the plasma psilocybin level or the plasma psilocin level. So subjects that had higher plasma psilocin in their blood also had higher levels of complexity. And finally, we wondered why, what mechanism do these transition energies decrease? And we know that these psychedelics act on 5-HT2A serotonin receptors, which we know have a very specific spatial map in the brain. So we have this spatial map from PET imaging in a totally different set of subjects. So this PET imaging was allowing us to basically assess the concentration level of the 5-HT2A as well as other serotonin, types of serotonin receptors in the brain. And we could in integrate that into our network control theory model by inputting that into our matrix B, if you remember. So we also have this matrix B that tells us how much influence each region has over the dynamics of the system. So our hypothesis was that perhaps if we assigned regions with a high level of 5-HT2A concentration, more control in the system, that we might also have lowered transition energies. And so we went ahead and did that experiment by calculating transition energy with a uniform matrix B and then with a matrix B that was derived from the serotonin receptor maps. And we saw that there was a decrease in transition energy across the board when we used the 5-HT2A concentrations, so receptor concentrations as, as the control weights in the system. We compared this also to other types of serotonin receptors, and we see that the 5-HT2A sort of spatial organization of the 5-HT2A has an optimal energetic, an optimal organization to decrease the energy that's required to transition between states in the brain. So finally, I'll, I'll try to go through this quickly. This is a DMT study that was just published in PNAS from Chris Timmerman's lab, and they allowed us to, to analyze the data as well. And this is a simultaneous fMRI and EEG recording because we don't want to rely heavily on the bold signal since we know psychedelics also affect vascular function. 
And so it's good also to have an external validation of the EEG recordings. This was a continuous scan for 28 minutes, where eight minutes into the scan, they were given an injection of placebo or DMT. And then they uh, either had a trip or did not. And every minute they were asked, uh, you know, their subjective drug intensity ratings, and that's sort of a, an objective measure of their drug intensity. So the first thing we have the global transition energy over time, over the scan. So here we used a slightly different method to extract the transition energies between just pairs of TRs. So we get a time series of global transition energies. And we see that at the time of the injection, both groups sort of decrease a bit. And then we think that's due to the uh, level of arousal that occurs when you're told you're about to possibly be injected with DMT. And then as the placebo group sort of realizes they got placebo, they go back up and, and it all kind of starts to, to increase over time as they are starting to get more fatigued. And then DMT remains low. So these are significantly different. Then we also correlated the change in control energy with a change in EEG signal diversity. So... It's a measure of the entropy of neuro neuronal activity at this point, because it's uh, at this time, because it's EEG derived and not fMRI derived. And we saw that they were correlated. So it seems like this control energy is not only reflecting changes in fMRI, but also um, independently validated to sort of EEG data. We also see a, a relationship between the decrease in control energy and the subjective intensity ratings that were obtained every minute in, in the scan. We also wanted to analyze sort of the spatial distribution of this decrease in energetic control and control energies. And so we looked at region level differences in the pre and post injection control energies. So you can see here the brain is mostly blue, indicating most of those regions have decreased control energy. There's some that have are more blue than others. And then we also looked at the DMT nodal control energy correlations with EEG signal diversity. So we looked to see how much the, the energy changes were related to EEG signal diversity. And then we also correlated the DMT's nodal control energy with a correlation of, uh, we correlated with drug intensity. So these are kind of spatial representations of the changes that we see due to DMT. And we wanted to see how those overlapped with the serotonin 2A receptor, which we hypothesize and we know from previous studies is one of the strongest mechanisms of action of psychedelics. And we see that they're all correlated. So it, it, this is indicating the regions with more serotonin 2A receptors have bigger changes according to the D, uh, bigger changes due to the DMT injection. We also did a dominance analysis. Sorry if that's really fuzzy. I'm not sure what happened there. A dominance analysis to demonstrate that compared to other receptor densities, it seems like the 5-HT2A is more related to the changes that are occurring in DMT than, than other receptor maps. We also did a simulation study where we show we took the some previous modeling that we have of the DMT concentration trajectory over time in the blood to get a sort of hypothesized plasma level of concentration of the DMT. <clears throat> and we did an outer product with the 2A receptor density map to get a node by time sort of control strategy matrix that we then applied to the resting state data. And to see what would happen if we applied this sort of control strategy to the resting state data, what would happen? So here's the empirical DMT that was observed, the observed control energy for, for the experiments. And then this was the simulated DMT, the simulated control energy using the simulation that I just described before applied to the placebo data. And you can see they align pretty well. So this is sort of a simulation validation of the mechanism that we propose that it's, it's working through the 5-HC2A receptor map. Okay, I know I'm really close to my time here. So just to conclude, the, the I hope you have taken away from this that the brain is a complex dynamical system that possibly could be modeled using network control theory. And this allows us to have a unifying framework where we incorporate structural uh, activity patterns observed from fMRI or EEG and receptor information. And it might reveal how these dynamics change in disease, recovery, and development. And it can help us to quantify the effects of cognitive tests, hormones, and, and pharmacological agents on brain dynamics. And it could potentially be used to model the effects of neurotransmitters on brain activity as well. And we saw that there were global energy increases in multiple sclerosis and TBI and substance use disorders, and with a family history of substance use and estradiol levels as well. And there are large energetic decreases in acute psychedelic brains. And you know, using this approach may allow us to better understand disease or recovery mechanisms, and possibly ways to modulate brain dynamics, which could help people recover from injury or uh, disease. So that, with that, I'll just acknowledge my funding sources and, and thank you all.